So my name is Jenny McLean, and I am the lead environmental science teacher here at Fiveable. Um, today we're going to go over terrestrial and aquatic biomes um, and get right into that. All right, so let's go. Um, you guys want to let me know, are you currently AP environmental science students? Cool, awesome. Um, that's an exciting year for you then. Uh, this is my favorite course. I think you guys are gonna really enjoy it. So let's jump right in. Um, biomes are a way to look at different parts of the earth. And it's really important for environmental science to understand the different biomes and what's there. Um, mostly because of what impact that has on the plants and animals that live there and the people that are kind of there as well by country lines. So a biome is divided by the um, weather that's gonna go on there and the precipitation. So the temperature and the amount of rain is gonna signify one biome from another. And based on that, different plants are gonna be able to grow. That combination is gonna change what is in that specific area. And a lot of times plants and animals can't jump out of their biome. They're really gonna be stuck there. The only uh, exception is gonna be birds because they tend to migrate back and forth. But even in the ocean, um, animals can't really swim out of their given biome. They're not adapted for it. So they're kind of stuck where they are. And then if you impose country lines on top of that, resources that people have access to are really sort of limited. So if you're in a desert ecosystem, you can't just decide to grow a forest. It's not going to work. And so because of that, you're not going to have lumber um, and you're not going to have access to that resource. Same thing with looking at oil um, or water. And different countries, different peoples have to deal with not having access to those things based on what biome they're in. So that kind of develops that political side as far as which biome you're in and how that's going to affect you. Um, so let's go ahead and jump right in here. We're going to start looking at the different biomes. We're going to start with terrestrial biomes. Um, terrestrial just means on land. Um, terra is Latin for like dirt or land. So terrestrial, um, you can think of a terrarium as something you would keep your uh, like lizard in, where in aquariums you would keep your fish in. So terrestrial is going to mean uh, land. And let's start here with the tundra. Um, so the tundra is the very most northern biome that we can look at. And you can see kind of in that map there, it highlights it. So very northern, there's some tundra in Alaska, um, Canada. And it's a very cold, low uh, precipitation place. So there's not a lot of rain uh, there or snow. It is going to melt in the summer. It has a very short growing period of about four months. And so the animals and plants and things can uh, you know, have their babies grow in that four month period. But that's a very short amount of time when we look at some of the other biomes. And as a result, the plants grow very, very slowly. They're, very small, hardy plants. They're kind of crunchy and little shrubs, uh, not much more than like six inches off the ground. Every winter, it's gonna be completely frozen. The soil is completely frozen. Um, under about that first layer, uh, a foot or so down, it stays frozen all year round. So that's what we call the permafrost. So the soil that's deeper down never thaws out. It is always frozen. And that surface level, that thaws out for four months out of the year, it just becomes this kind of like swamp at that point. And it's this mud, um, it's perfect habitat for mosquitoes. So up in that Northern area in those four months, it is just insanely full of mosquitoes because think of it as just standing mud water. It can't drain. If it does get any rain, it's not gonna drain down because there's gonna be that uh, frozen layer that's still underneath it. So perfect for mosquitoes. Um, a lot of times that's where the um, uh, reindeer are going to come up and they reproduce and migrate north um, to graze on the tundra. And they are just tormented by mosquitoes. A lot of times the mosquitoes get so bad it starts stampedes because um, it's just miserable, thousands and thousands. Um, so yeah, the major human impact in the tundra is going to be that rising global temperature. So we all know with ice, um, 32 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, 33 degrees Fahrenheit, and it's going to be water. So if we go up one degree, then it's no longer permafrost and it's going to just melt and become mud 
and eventually drain and dry out. So it'll completely alter that ecosystem. And I know we talk about climate change a lot and just changing one degree up is gonna devastate this ecosystem. Whereas some other ecosystems, one degree isn't gonna make that big of a deal. You know, if it goes up one degree in the desert, you know, it's just one more degree, but the tundra is reliant on ice. So that is gonna be a huge impact to this ecosystem. And feel free at any point to type in a question when we are moving, otherwise we're just gonna keep moving right along. Uh, the next southern ecosystem that you come in, it has two different names that you can hear it by, and it will appear um, with both these names on the test. So the taiga or the boreal forest. And that's that forest that runs kind of all the way across the top. Um, this forest is typically going to be conifers um, or evergreen plants. Evergreens are plants that never drop their leaves in the winter. The plants that do that are deciduous. So evergreen, just think of it as forever green. They're never gonna drop um, their leaves. They have uh, pine needles. So these are Christmas tree type plants that are growing up there. They grow very slow because again, it's very cold um, and there's not a lot of rain. Um, this area though, just gets a little bit more rain and a little bit more sun. So it is enough to support the growth of trees, but not very much. Uh, the animals that live here tend to be animals that are really good at living in cold temperatures. So moose, bear, and wolves. Um, there's also smaller animals too, but you got those really big animals that are able to withstand the cold temperature. Um, this ecosystem has been extensively logged, especially in the European Russian um, areas. They have lost massive amounts of this forest, logging it um, specifically for paper or building materials. But so logging in this forest is one of the biggest human impacts and why um, that is being changed. All right, temperate forests, uh, temperate forests are, oops, sorry, temperate rainforests. So temperate rainforests, this is a very unique ecosystem and there aren't a lot of them. Um, in um, the US, this would be kind of Northern California, Oregon and Washington. This again is gonna be those conifers mostly. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll, uh, I'll slow down a little bit on each one. No problem. The taiga and boreal forest also, um, as far as human impact are, um, there's a lot of mining there as far as oil reserves. So those ecosystems tend to have large deposits of oil. And so there's a lot of drilling, the tendency for oil spills happens. So that ecosystem also sort of faces that or pipelines, uh, the Alaska pipeline is a huge pipe basically that carries oil from the top of Alaska uh, down to the bottom. So that's something else that is a potential there for human impact. All right, temperate rainforests. Temperate rainforests are very unique. You can see there are not um, a ton of them throughout the world. And these are, you kind of think of it as like a cold rainforest. So up in Northern California, this is where um, the giant trees are. And that's because of the amount of water. Um, it's pretty much a 12 month growing period. So what we looked at before was a four month. This is year round, these plants are able to grow. Um, and it's pretty much constantly raining on them. Um, so it's everything a, a plant could want to, to just grow out of control. And so um, it's really neat in California, they have the biggest trees and those are the sequoias and they're the biggest because they're, they'd be the heaviest by weight. They're the largest around, um, you know, they're, they're big enough around that 20 people can hold hands and they can't even reach all the way around it. They're just absolutely massive. Um, a lot of them have been carved, so you can drive cars through them and things. They Instead of taking it down, they just build the road right through the middle of it. So they're just absolutely massive, very cool. And um, redwood trees are the tallest trees, and they've been recorded at 356 feet tall. So that is just insanely tall, um, you know, bigger than most large buildings. So they're, they're huge. Um, and a fun fact about that, they actually figured out that that is the point at which gravity 
um, breaks hydrogen bonds in water and that's why the trees can't grow any taller because it's basically like a straw won't work after 356 feet uh, because the water just breaks apart and so the tree can't suck water all the way up to the top so getting distracted but fun fact about trees and, and kind of why physics limits them to be a certain height which is still a really tall height but um, anyway so the continuous rain um, is really good for them the soil here is not uh, it doesn't have that much nutrients and I think that it, it would except for the fact that all the nutrients is trees so if there is a available spot where there is sunlight hitting the ground a tree is going to grow there and it is going to take off and it's going to take up all, all that nutrients so if you sort of think about all the nutrients that was there is now in the form of trees um, there's a lot of nutrients in the ecosystem it's just not available it's, it's stuck as a tree um, so really cool ecosystem not a lot can live there other than those giant um, conifers though so like the redwoods and sequoias um, nothing can compete with them they just grow over the top of them and the other tree can't get uh, any light and then it dies the only things that can live kind of below them are low light plants so like ferns are able so it's really uh just you know giant redwoods and ferns and there's like not a lot else it's very um not not too biodiverse um even though there's a lot of biomass there overall um the same impact here as far as human impact there's been a lot of logging um and these trees are absolutely massive so they're great for building houses um they live for a really, really long time. Um, California, again, also has the oldest living trees, and that's the bristlecone pines. They live for over 2,000 years, um, and that's just what we know so far. Um, to give you some idea of how long that really is, that means that there are trees that are alive right now, single trees, so not like propagates of trees, like an actual single tree um, that was alive when the pyramids were being built. So it's kind of crazy to think about that they do live for, seems like forever, um, takes them a really long time to grow to that size. Um, and initially when the West was sort of discovered, um, everyone was like, wow, these trees are huge. This is awesome. We can build so many things with these. And they just went crazy and they cut them all down. And it is really tragic. There's not very many original old growths left, the original huge ones. Um, you can still find them, but, but definitely not what it used to be. A lot of those were damaged and you know, it takes a thousand years for them to get that big again. So not necessarily in our lifetime, we'll see that big old growth forest back, but maybe if we continue to protect it, it, it will come back. Um, this ecosystem has sort of your typical forest animals. You're gonna have deer, elk, bear, squirrels, raccoons, that sort of thing, um, and migratory animals as well. But um, yeah, so these animals kind of have an easier uh, go at it because it is temperate. So they're not gonna have to deal with freezing temperatures. It, it's hardly ever gonna, if it snows here, it's gonna be very little bit. And then in the summer, um, you know, it might get into the high 70s for a little bit. Um, and there's gonna be a lot of uh, fog going on. So it's very mild temperature um, all year round. And a little bit on the cold side, as well that the mass of trees here transpiring or uh, putting air back up means that it's almost always cloudy. In the tundra, the majority of the human impact is gonna be drilling, as well as the potential for human impact on um, the temperature change. So if the temperature goes up one degree, the tundra will just melt and there just won't be a tundra anymore. So um, one degree you know, here in the temperate rainforest isn't really going to matter that much um, but so the tundra is very temperature specific because it is frozen um, and a lot of tundra ecosystem that's a little bit more south so like in Canada has started to melt and not uh, not freeze again anymore um, and so we're already kind of seeing that what happens when the earth goes up one degree um, you know and that leads to other issues there's a ton of dead plants frozen in the tundra. The tundra doesn't have a lot of decomposition because it's so cold. Every, it's like your freezer, everything's frozen, so it's not gonna decompose. You just have dead plants on dead plants. Um, but if you thaw it, then it's gonna get nasty and it's gonna start to decompose real fast. And the result of that is a lot of carbon dioxide and methane coming off the tundra. So 
We do not want that to, to melt. We can, we can help it, but might not be much we can do at this point. All right, uh, let's uh, head on over to our next ecosystem here. No problem. Please ask any questions that you have. Um, whoops. Okay, so the next one down, temperate seasonal forest. So temperate, again, means that it's going to be um, kind of in the middle, not extreme. Think of temperate as not extreme. And seasonal means that it's going to have seasons here, um, and it's a forest. So temperate seasonal forest, the climate is warm summers and cold winters, um, over 40 inches of rain annually. So there's a lot of rain here, but not like the rainforest that we were just talking about. Um, the soil is nutrient rich due to the abundance of leaves. And those leaves are there because of the deciduous trees. So deciduous, and those are the trees that are beautiful coming up here in a, in a month or so in fall, and they're gonna drop all their leaves. The reason they drop all their leaves is because they're broad leaves, they're big leaves, and they can freeze. If they freeze, that's gonna damage the plant. It could kill the plant. So to not freeze, it drops all the leaves. And then that way um, it's gonna be safe through the winter and then it'll grow new leaves um, the next year. But all that nutrients gets dropped back down into the soil. And then when it heats up in the summer, that's perfect, you know, it's, there's moisture, there's heat, and you're gonna have that decomposition and that soil is really nutrient rich. So at, uh, these ecosystems are really good for growing plants and that's going to be the biggest um, human impact in this area and i see i left the animals blank um this one as far as animals is going to be really similar to the last one so you're going to have a lot the four typical forest animals you're going to have a lot of bear deer um there would have been wolves in these ecosystems in a lot of these ecosystems the wolves have been driven out so um, in the eastern U.S., there's not going to be wolves as well as in Europe. They're mostly um, have been driven to extinction for those those areas, but there would have been um, in the, in the past. Um, but yeah, so going back to human impact, this has largely been converted to agriculture. So the majority of these forest lands um, aren't there anymore, and it has been turned into farms. Good question. Deciduous is going to be the ones that have big leaves and they drop their leaves every um, winter. Um, there are some cases where they drop them in the summer and that's like if it's in the uh, desert and they're trying not to, to dry out. But for the most part, you can think of deciduous, meaning that they drop their leaves in the winter. So deciduous, big leaves like an oak tree. Um, deciduous are gonna be the pretty ones um, in the fall. Conifers are cone-bearing trees. So con, cone-bearing. Um, conifers are gonna be like a Christmas tree. And so they have the needles and they are not gonna drop their leaves all at once. They still shed leaves like a person, you know, your hair comes out piece by piece. Like that's kind of what they do. They replace leaves and stuff, um, but they don't just like drop it all. Just if a person was deciduous, like every winter, all their hair would fall out. So that's, that's kind of the difference between those two. Um, Conifers are typically in harder to live places like cold climates um, and deciduous are typically in more temperate places. No problem. All right, I'm gonna jump on over to the next one here. All right, tropical rainforest. This one I feel like people are usually really uh, probably the most familiar with. I feel like a lot of times in like fifth grade and stuff, we did rainforest projects. So we feel pretty confident with this one. Um, and you hear about it all the time in like documentaries, but yeah, tropical rainforest. This is like the Amazon. Uh, there's also tropical rainforest in Africa um, and in Indonesia. And this is warm climate and very wet. It's going to rain all the time there. And that is the perfect, uh, recipe for plants to grow. So there is going to be a massive amount of biodiversity here and biomass. Every available inch of space is going to have something living in it and growing there. Um, so same sort of problem with the last rainforest as far as soil. The second that there's a 
a space, something's going to grow. So the soil itself doesn't have a lot of nutrients. And that kind of goes to with like the human impact we're going to talk about. In order to grow food there, a lot of times they do what's called slash and burn agriculture. So that is just what it sounds like. So they'll come in and they'll cut down the trees. Um, oh, or sometimes they don't even cut down the trees. Sometimes they just catch the forest on fire. And I know that that's like we've all been hearing um, in the news and on social media lately about the rainforest burning. A lot of those fires were started from slash and burn agriculture and they, they just took off. Um, it was a particularly dry year and so they didn't have as much control over it as they thought and and that's obviously not why all of them are burning but a lot of them um so yeah so uh typically they're doing it because they want to grow palm trees to make palm oil um so they'll come in burn down however many acres of forest and burnt up trees, ash has a ton of nutrients. So when you burn down a tree, all of the nutrients in that tree is now in the soil. Um, so then they plant palms and uh, nothing else. So just palms and that. So now we're doing a monoculture, which is just one type of plant where before it was like an extremely diverse ecosystem, the most diverse terrestrial ecosystem. Um, now it just has one. Um, and then they are harvesting those palms to make oil. And so that a lot of times is in our food. And it's something that, you know, you can look at, make a conscious decision not to purchase if you want, because the majority of palm oil does come from the Amazon from slash and burn agriculture. So um, something that that's in a lot of times that's easy to check is peanut butter. So if you're looking at a peanut butter to buy, you can see which one has palm oil in it. Um, and one of the animals that's really impacted by that is the like orangutan so they need a complex forest in order to live in they don't ever come down on the ground if they can help it they, they want to stay in the trees their whole life um and if it's all burned down or there's just palm trees they can't live in palm trees um so that they're being directly impacted by that industry um and that farming practice um let's make sure i went over all it here oh, okay in the forest there's so much growth here that uh, we're not just looking at it as like one picture. We're looking at it in layers of growth. So there's a canopy, which is the trees that grow to the very top. So very tall trees are going to make the canopy. Then there's a sub canopy of trees that live below them. And they're going to be living on like, um, you know, half, half the sunlight or so. So they need to be able to deal with that. And then there's going to be an understory. And that's going to be like those ferns and things living on the very bottom that get very little light. Um, coming all the way down on the very bottom if you were to like walk around you'd have almost no direct sunlight hitting you so it's all just kind of like ambient lighting um as if you were like indoors or something but no actual sunlight um, gets all the way down to the bottom because of how many plants are growing um very competitive for plants and that's why there are so many different species of plants and animals growing in that ecosystem all right let's go uh, on our next one All right, shrubland. So this one is also, you can see kind of a unique ecosystem. There's not a lot of it, it's not huge. Um, and shrubland, this is called different things depending on where you are. Um, a lot of times in the US it's called chaparral um, instead of shrubland, um, but it is just in that sort of Southern California on the coast. So I think if you think about human impact, what's gonna be the first big issue there is everybody wants to live in Southern California on the coast. So people making houses and cities and things like that is gonna be the biggest initial impact uh, of this ecosystem. Cause it's not just in Southern California, you know, everywhere that this ecosystem exists, people wanna live there. And that's because of the climate, hot, dry summers um, and mild rainy winters. It's that, you know, uh, LA beach temperature is really nice to be in. So everyone wants to live there. Um, so urban sprawl and the growth of cities is going to be your major impact on this shrubland. Um, shrubland is, it's kind of like, think of it as like a desert, uh, that gets just a little bit more rain. So you're not going to have like trees growing here. These are going to be plants that are, um, kind of waste level, a lot of sage and, um, different types of shrubs that are, they're drought tolerant plants. So these plants are good at living in not a lot of rain. Um, 
but yeah, a little bit higher than what you think of as a, as a desert plant. Um, very dry. Um, the animals living in this ecosystem are going to be more desert adapted animals. Um, and it, it is, it is going to be very dry. So you, you'll have like a, you can go six months in the summer without rain. So it, it is very desert like, uh, just not as hot. Um, and it does rain, you know, um, in the winter and human impact as well. Let's see urban growth. Oh, this climate is the perfect temperature to grow wine. So if you kind of look at where it is on the map, there are, that's where vineyards are. So a lot of it has been changed um, or cut down so that people can grow wine. And that, that's another large impact to this area. Um, also fires, uh, if you think of anything that goes along with Southern California, that is something else that's huge there. So this ecosystem is often damaged by uh, large fires. And that's something that with um, global climate change is happening more and more and larger fires are, are taking it out. However, the plants are very adapted to fire. So you can have a, a huge fire come through, it's devastated, it looks like Mars, you know, there's just charred rock, no, nothing growing. And then it'll rain once and you'll see little plants sprouting back up. A lot of the plants can burn, but their roots will stay alive. And the next time it rains, they just come back. So similar, I guess, to like grass being mowed and they just, it comes right back. So it is highly adapted to fires and it is able to recover really fast. It's not as devastating as like a, a forest fire where those trees, you know, took a really long time to grow and they, they're just gonna die when they burn. Um, this ecosystem is really adapted to that. You can come right back. Right, let's keep All right, so temperate grassland. Um, this is also called different things uh, depending on like what country you're in. Um, in the U.S., we just think of this as like the prairie a lot. And there's different. Um, obviously, it's so huge. This is like the entire center of the U.S. Um, there's different kind of areas of it because you're going to have different um, subclimates where some get more water than others so there's long grass prairies and there's short grass prairies depending on how much uh, rain they get and this is going to be think of yellowstone so yellowstone has uh, those massive uh, bison and antelope elk moose um, bear although the grizzlies aren't going to typically be out in the grass they tend to uh, stay more in um rocky like mountainous areas but those are sort of the animals that are, are living in this area because of the grass it's able to support massive amounts of animals so in the u.s this is you know historically where the bison were and there are more bison than any other herd species anywhere at the time you know before they were all taken out um, so just massive amount of biomass as far as animals being able to graze on the prairie and we're going to get into it in just a second, but you'll notice that um, in Africa, it, it is not highlighted as having temperate, temperate grassland. And I know you might think like that the uh, savanna counts as this, but we're going to explain kind of why that's not, it doesn't count. Um, so grassland is only grass. There's not going to be any trees, um, large herds of grazing animals and um the grass is really dependent on those animals as well to kind of mow it down and fertilize it. So really symbiotic relationship between big animals and grass growing uh, really quickly. Grass is also really adapted to fires. So there's gonna be a lot of fires spreading really quickly in these ecosystems um, because of the hot, dry summers. But you know, grass, the roots aren't damaged at all. So the next time it rains, it's gonna pop right back up. Um, the, Soil is really high in nutrients in order to support all of that uh, plant growth. And human impact. So because this is such a good place for plants to grow, 98% of tall grass prairie, and tall grass prairie is gonna be like a little bit more to the east. The more to the west you go, obviously it's gonna be more desert. So that's gonna be shorter grasses. Um, tall and short, they cut it off at, I think I believe it's 20 inches. So grass that grows above 20 inches is gonna be called a tall grass prairie and below 20 is a short grass prairie. So it's still long grass, it's just uh, not really tall. Um, 
98% of them have been converted into farms. So agriculture is just another way of saying farms. Um, so that's a lot. That's almost the entire uh, biome, the entire ecosystem has been, I guess, destroyed and turned into something for farming. Um, short grass prairies, the same thing, they, uh, but they're not used for growing plants. It's for grazing for cattle. So um, essentially we just said, you know, let's just take all these bison out of here and let's put cows instead and we'll just like keep the ecosystem going as it is. So the majority of grasslands in the U.S. and in the other places of the world have been uh, changed to farming because it's it's ideal. You can grow a lot of food really quickly um, and those are all going to be your large monocultures. So just one type of plant. Um, yeah, growing in those ones. All right. Any uh, questions on grasslands or we'll pop over to Savannah. All right, the major difference, so you can see in that picture, so that picture to this picture here um, is the sparse trees. So the availability of having some trees is what makes it a savanna, um, and that's the difference. And so I would put a little SAR, write that down um, so that you can remember the biggest difference between savanna and grassland is those trees. All right, so this is a going to be typically warm year round, um, but there is going to be wet and dry seasons. So you'll you'll have it be warm all year, but you're going to have kind of like a drought and you're going to have like a warm rain at some point as well. Um, the soil here is very nutrient rich, but it's going to have that uh, limiting factor of water that's going to drop it off. Uh, this is where we're going to say those plants, uh, they are deciduous and they drop their leaves, but it's not going to be in the winter. Um, the winter is actually when they would want to grow because that's the rainy season. Um, so the hot, dry summer is when they're going to drop their leaves so that they don't lose too much water and die. Um, so a little bit different strategy there. Um, the, you're going to have your large grazing animals here. So this is your like typical African safari animals. Uh, so you'd have like wildebeest, zebra, lions, all that. That stuff but the fact that there are so many um, as far as population and diversity of large animals is really indicative of how nutrient rich that soil is and uh, the biome in general so the fact that there's enough grass to support all of those large um, herbivores that can support all of those large predators um, is really based on on that combination there mm -hmm. And 99% of savanna has been converted into agriculture. So again, um, if it's an ecosystem that's really nutrient rich soil and it has enough rain, um, or if the water could be piped in, a lot of times if we can use um, aqueducts to bring the rain, the water in, then it can just be converted over. That's what happened a lot in uh, California as well. So. Um, yeah, so most of this one doesn't exist anymore either. And I think that's why we see that uh, impact on those species as well. A lot of the savanna species are endangered just because of loss of habitat. All right, so we are finally to deserts. Um, deserts, another one where we usually feel pretty comfortable with understanding. It's places that are hot um, and they don't get a lot of water. A lot of times in the winter, deserts can be really cold as well. And any place that doesn't have a lot of water is going to have large variance in temperature. And that's because water is pretty good at holding a temperature. Um, and so if it's dry, it's going to jump, you know, very high to very low. So deserts can also be really cold too. You're not going to see like the snow because again, they don't have water, um, but it could be below freezing in a desert as well. Um, typically low in nutrients, and that's just because there's not plants growing and dropping their leaves and, and building that um, biological base to the soil. The soils are usually very sandy and rocky, so it's gonna be difficult for plants to grow at all there. Um, sparse vegetation, there's not gonna be a lot of plants growing. Plants are gonna have to be very adapted to deal with the low, um, the low water. So a cactus is a really good example of a plant that is growing in the desert and it's gonna be adapted to that. Cactus are, um, the spines are their leaves. So the spines are modified leaves. They don't do photosynthesis in their leaves at all. Um, the 
barrel of the cactus is the stem and that is what does photosynthesis so they really don't even have leaves um they do but they're just spines they're not they're just used for defense um and the cactus has like a very spongy inside and it's going to swell when it rains and, and be able to store that water um they're not usually fire adapted because there's not very many fires in the desert just because there's not a lot of plants to burn so if a fire did start it would likely just burn the one plant it was on and not be able to jump because there's not um, there's not even enough plants really to to run a fire not everywhere but for the most part you don't really hear about um, fires in deserts um, it's mostly in like chaparral or grasslands where that happens um animals have to be really drought adapted too typically you're going to see smaller animals um hot climates tend to have smaller animals um just because it's easier to uh smaller surface area and so it's easier for them to cool down. So reptiles, birds, and rodents are gonna be living in this area. A lot of times animals are nocturnal or they live underground in order to escape that heat. Um, that's a good question. So, Let me think about it a little bit. I think that Antarctic is gonna be described differently because of the amount of, of water that's there. So I think the biggest cutoff is gonna be water availability. And I guess it's if you're saying water present or water available because the water is there, but it's frozen. Um, so I wouldn't classify it as a desert. Um, yeah, I wouldn't classify it as a desert uh, because of that. You know, that ecosystem is going to be um, you know, the best way to describe it. It's a good question. <laughs> um, yeah, I wouldn't classify it as a desert just because of the presence of, of the water, even though it's unavailable at the time. Um, but it, it is a limiting factor. Thank you for bringing that up. It's a good question. Um, all right. Uh, oh, human impact in the desert. So because the growth is extremely slow there, um, any human impact is going to take forever to erase. So if you were to ride your off-road vehicle through the desert, um, and run over some plants. So, you know, those plants could have taken a hundred years to grow, even though they're just like three or four inches off the ground. Um, and so it's going to be very difficult for them to come bouncing back. Whereas if you were to, you know, off-road in the grassland, the grass is going to grow right back and you wouldn't even know you, you did that. So that's a huge impact that, um, unfortunately, we kind of learned a little bit late. So there was a, a good amount of damage done to our deserts before we realize that even like um, tire track marks, it's going to take forever for them to go away because it's just not going to rain. So if it had rained on them, it would wash them away. Um, but literally, if you just rode your motorcycle through the desert, those track marks might be there for 20 years um, before they, they wash them away. Um, another one of the major human impacts in the U.S. deserts is the impact to um, turtles and burrowing animals because of people crushing those burrows. So a lot of animals can't make burrows. They rely on other animals to do it for them. And then if the other animals are there, there's nowhere to hide. And so that was a big um, impact that people saw. And then I know mitigated a lot of that by making artificial burrows in the desert to try to help animals bounce back from some of that um, human impact. Mm, oh, one more thing we want to go over before we forget here. Um, the difference between perennials and annuals. So perennials are um, plants that live year round. And so before kind of talking about deciduous and coniferous, those are, those are terms we use to talk about trees. So perennials and annuals are terms we talk about like uh, plants, like shrubs and different things with. Um, so perennials growing in the desert are going to be like a cactus. So something that's going to live year round for years and years. Um, and an annual is a plant that comes back every year and it might only live for a couple months. And so 
in the desert, if it rains, you're going to have a huge amount of plants like come out of nowhere. And so a lot of times in the desert, they have beautiful wildflower growths really quickly after a rain. Uh, all these plants will grow up. They'll have beautiful flowers. They will reproduce and drop seeds and then they'll die because there's no more rain. So deserts often have these like uh, spontaneous kind of pop-ups of beautiful color and flowers and then they they die again and it's just dependent on that rain so they do then they drop all their leaves and, or they drop all their seeds and then there's just these dry seeds um, kind of hanging out in the desert until it rains again next time so those two different types of plants are growing there um, as well all right all right, so we're going to jump now to aquatic biomes. Aquatic biomes are going to be things that are in the water. Um, first terms to kind of look at, marine. Um, marine means any water ecosystem uh, that's in salt water. So if you think of marine, think salt water. Typically, it means the ocean. Uh, marine ecosystems include estuaries, coral reefs, and open ocean. And we're going to go over each one of those um, in just a second. But in the slide, really just grab marine means salt water. All right, so first one here is coral reefs. Coral reefs that are, that map is going to show you kind of where they are distributed. They're found in warm, shallow water, uh, just beyond the shoreline. So they're, they're a little bit deeper. They're not right on the shore. Um, a key point here is that coral reefs are the most diverse ecosystem. So coral reefs are the most diverse ecosystem um on earth so that's something to keep in mind if the test asks you what is the most diverse terrestrial ecosystem then you're going to go back to your um tropical rainforest but overall coral reefs are going to be um, number one um coral is a animal it is a colony of these little guys you can see the picture the red picture um they look like sea anemones they're just really tiny um, and they put down a skeleton of limestone as they grow. And that limestone is like a hard rock. So as they continue to grow and grow, they build these like giant structures um, of rock basically for thousands and thousands of years. And that is a coral reef. Um, coral bleaching is when, oh, well, go back a step here. They, corals only grow in very nutrient poor warm water. So there's not a lot of nutrients there. The only way that they can grow there is because they have single-celled algae living in their skin. And that algae obviously uses the sunlight and the structure of the coral as they, they build up towards the surface of the water. Yep, tropical rainforest is going to be the most diverse terrestrial biome. The most diverse overall or aquatic is coral reef. Um, but yeah, so they have these algae growing in them. It's a symbiotic relationship. Um, sometimes, and the most current belief is when the water gets too hot, the algae die and they, 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 they're they gone. Once they die, they're gone. They can't get them back. And that's when the coral turns white because the algae are what's giving them their color. So that is coral bleaching. The coral turns white and without the um, algae living in them, you know, another little bit goes by a week a month and then the algae or the coral itself dies so it, it bleaches and then it dies and the bleaching is the loss of the algae and that can happen you know again with climate change as water temperatures are rising and then if there's like a El Nino event or something a storm that's going to bring a, a flush of warm water um, into the area they, they'll die the coral will bleach and die and then they won't come back um, and that's been a massive impact on the Great Barrier Reef. Um, the majority of the Great Barrier Reef has bleached and died. And I, I believe that was in 2007. That was um, when it had a huge bleaching event. The good news here with that is with climate change, unlike, you know, the tundra can't move. You know, it's just going to, there's going to be no more tundra. But coral can move, not an individual. But when they release their egg, they fly all over the ocean. They're just in the open ocean they could land somewhere more south or more north, somewhere that's going to be a little bit colder. So we might not lose corals altogether. It might just move. 
and you know if the equator becomes too hot and they can't live there you might see coral reefs showing up more south or more north so that it's in more cooler regions possibly we'll see what happens with that all right so we'll move on from coral open ocean um the open ocean so this is like the whole ocean this is a huge amount of ecosystem that we're talking about this is the biggest you know mass on earth um you don't need to know all of these things necessarily, but let's just look at the first bullet point here. So um, this is away from the shoreline is what we're calling the open ocean. And there's two main zones that are really important to understand. The other picture is really just to kind of like show you how deep it is, how, like, how big it is. The photic zone, think photo light. Um, photic zone is where the sunlight can enter and how deep it reaches down. It's the upper layer that gets enough sunlight for photosynthesis. So that's why it's so important. This is where all of the plants in the ocean are. And we're talking about floating algae, mostly single cell floating algae. That's in the photic zone. After the photic zone, this is an area that has not enough light to support plant growth. So all of the whole ecosystem as far as food and energy has to rely on stuff falling down from above, like dead things falling down. Um, there are some very specific few ecosystems that have um, like have volcanoes that produce sulfuric acid and then they have chemosynthesis going on. But uh, for the most part, uh, photic zone is where there's algae and that's where all of the animals and life is. And so now that you know that, let's look at this picture on the right here, that very teeny tiny one on top, um, that's the photic zone. So everything, the mesopelagic and everything below it, is there's no plants. So that's kind of crazy to think about the only like life and like fish and everything that's, you know, those ecosystems are all coming off of that one little area on the very top. And I believe it is about 600 feet down. So you can see really how massive the ocean is. And it, there are animals down there, but they're, again, they're relying on like dead things falling down to them in order to get their their nutrients um the ocean is majorly impacted by overfishing obviously or the introduction of floating plastic like uh, ghost nets or um just plastic pollution floating around in the top and plastic kind of represented or became this new sort of trash like you think about it before plastic was invented if you threw all your trash in the ocean it wouldn't really matter because you're throwing like glass which is just sand it's going to sink and paper which is going to dissolve it's just a plant and even metal you know is going to fall to the bottom it might rust and decay but those are all things that are like from the earth and they're going to kind of like get reincorporated back into it um plastic is something that's man-made and it floats which is like the big difference. It's floating around on the very surface level um, and kind of photodegrading into its components. So that's why it's such a huge problem like once plastic was invented with ocean pollution. Um, key thing to take away from the ocean, the majority of our oxygen comes from those single celled algae um, in that photic zone. So Again, the majority of our oxygen comes from the single-celled algae, more than the rainforests or you know anywhere else trees, um, the single-celled algae in the ocean. The productivity of different parts of the ocean are going to depend on upwelling of that area. It's going to depend on um, being close to like rivers. Obviously, if you're close to the Amazon, you're getting that influx of nutrients. That area of the ocean is going to be producing more. So it's really dependent on like where it is temperature, sunlight, nutrients, um, as far as like what exactly is going on in that ecosystem, how many animals are there, different things like that. Typically upwelling is gonna be the, the biggest um, kind of deterrent on, or determining factor on what's going on in that ecosystem. And upwelling is just the um, nutrients being sucked up from the bottom of the ocean and becoming available uh, to those types of animals. You think about all the uh, dead animals that fall to the bottom in the ocean. Every animal that dies in the ocean just falls to the bottom. That nutrients is waiting for a storm to upwell it and bring it all back to the top again. And then you'd have a, a boom of, of energy. All right, let's keep going. Trying to make sure we finish on time. The intertidal 
Um, this is the next major ecosystem in the ocean. Intertidal, a lot of times you think of tide pools, and that's right. Um, tide pools are really uh, based on rocks. That rock in the intertidal is like a hot commodity because it's going to be something that's stable and you can grab onto. But intertidal could be a sandy beach, um, any place that is from high tide to low tide. So a very tiny, narrow strip of land um, where these animals exist. And a uh, sandy beach might look like it doesn't have anything there, but underneath the sand, there's going to just be thousands of crabs and clams and different things that all kind of pop up as soon as the the water comes back over them. Um, people like to live at the beach, so that's gonna be your biggest impact here. It's gonna be runoff um, from houses or farms, factories, um, and then just human impact walking around on the beach, building their houses on the beach. Um, it's gonna change um, what's living there. A lot of times uh, cities that live are right on the ocean, their sewage dumps into the water. They It's treated first, so it's not raw sewage, but you can't treat out like, um, chemicals. One of the big things that's happened um, to the fish and organisms living in the intertidal is um, they actually are, their genders are, are changed. Um, there's been a lot of female fish born and that's just due to the influx of female hormones from birth control pills coming into the ocean. So that's an interesting fact because you can't pull that chemical out um, in water treatment centers. So interesting ways that we're impacting animals. A lot of female fish being born just because of the influx of estrogen um, in your cities. All right, um, fresh water. Sometimes we think of fresh water meaning like clean water. It doesn't. Fresh water means not salty. So again, marine was salt water. Fresh water means not salty water. So this is um, typically water that's gonna be found terrestrially, so on land. Um, streams and lakes, uh, as well as like uh, glaciers. Um, freshwater makes up only 2.5% of the total water on Earth and only 0.01% of the total water on Earth is um, aquatic like biomes, so like rivers, streets, lakes. Another way to think of that, um, so there's kind of a cool visual, if you had a gallon of water in front of you, so like a big gallon of water, um, and you took an eyedropper and you picked out one drop of water, that one drop of water is what would be available um, for like drinking water. So like lakes and rivers and streams. The rest of it is ocean or frozen in ice, like icebergs and glaciers. So it's kind of crazy to think about that. You know, the whole gallon of water is earth and one drop is what we have for drinking water. So not a lot, probably shouldn't be polluting it, but that's, that's what we've got. All right, um, streams and rivers are water that's like actively moving. There's no like specific, you know, if it's this big, it's a stream, and if it's this big, it's a river. It's kind of ambiguous as far as which is which, um, but it's just flowing water. It's either originating from melting snow or like an underground spring. Um, and for these ecosystems, typically look at the pace of the water to understand like how many animals are gonna be able to live there. Really fast moving cold water um, isn't gonna be able to support a lot of animals. Not a lot of plants are gonna be living there. It's typically gonna be really high in oxygen though, because if you think of like rapids moving around, that anytime that like um, water and air are mixing together, you're gonna to get oxygen pulled into the water. So uh, a lot of times streams and rivers are cold, oxygen rich and nutrient poor. So that's like, um, think of like mountainous rivers, you're not gonna have a lot of um, plants and animals. But when the water slows down, it warms up in the sun, you're gonna drop your oxygen level, but you're gonna start growing plants and having a lot of animals, um, algae, different things like that. So overall, um, I think they start up in the mountains with no nutrients, cold, um, and a lot of oxygen. And as they come down, it, it shifts to the other way. All right, and um, this is our last one here. So lakes and ponds, obviously this is water that is not specifically moving. It's just staying kind of where it is. Um, there are different zones in a lake. So similar to the ocean, um, the littoral zone is a shallow area. So right kind of near the shore, this would be similar to like the intertidal. 
The lamentic zone is open water, so it's too deep for rooted plants. Um, you could still have floating algae. Um, and the profundal zone is going to be in very deep lakes. There's going to be no sunlight in that area. Some lakes are extremely deep, like 2,000 feet deep. So some lakes are crazy deep, and they're completely black on the bottom of the light. Um, these ecosystems, a lot of times, are going to be impacted as far as drawing water out. Um, people are using them as, for drinking water. So a lot of water, a lot of the um, lakes and ponds in the Western US have been completely drained for drinking water. So they just, they don't exist anymore, so drink it. All right, and in our last few minutes here, I have a few questions that you might see on um, an exam. So you can test your knowledge and see if you've got it down. Um, so what factors are used to classify terrestrial, classify a terrestrial biome? Average temperature, average precipitation, or distinctive plants and animals? And feel free to throw your answer up in the um, group chat if you want, or you don't have to. Um, so the answer to that one is gonna be all three. So terrestrial biomes are by rain, um, temperature, and distinctive plants and animals that you're gonna find there. All right, which biome is characterized by the presence of permafrost? That is, yay, awesome, good job. That's gonna be the tundra. What is Earth's most diverse biome? Yep, coral reef. If it said Earth's most diverse terrestrial biome, then you're gonna go back to the uh, tropical rainforest. All right, which biome would have plants that are adapted, that have adapted their leaves into needles to prevent water loss? Absolutely, that one is the desert. And I think this is our last question here. Um, which two environmental factors slow decomposition and therefore create nutrient poor soil? This one's a little bit more tricky. I don't think I directly answered it, but we did kind of talk about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, excellent. So that's going to have to do directly with temperature and precipitation or the water. So think about decomposition. That's why you have a refrigerator, right? Um, if it's really cold, it's not going to decompose. Um, and then in the, in order to have like bacteria and funguses, they want like wet. So the warm, uh, moist environment, that's going to have the most decomposition and then it's going to have nutrient rich soil. So like the um, rainforest again would have nutrient rich soil. But, all right, cool. Thank you guys so much for coming to hang out. Please continue to come back um, and hopefully we can make sure that we do really well on this AP exam. All right, I'm gonna sign off guys. Have a good night.